So my name is Stuart Harodner. I'm the director of the University of Kentucky Art Museum. I want to thank everyone who's joined us tonight for a conversation with artist, filmmaker, musician, um, Jay Bolton. And I want to thank up front some folks who have made the museum's participation with Jay possible, in particular, uh, Dean Mark Shonda at the College of Fine Arts, Art and Marilyn Sheckett, and a few anonymous donors whose contributions have let us engage Jay in a pretty formidable way in the collaboration with working on his newest film in production right now. And that's the sort of reason that we've gathered tonight is to share a little bit of the wonder of uh, Jay and his work. Uh, I wanna tell you a little bit about him and then we'll start a conversation which I hope wanders into some interesting territory. For those of you who are watching, uh, you will see at the bottom of your screen, there is a, a Q and A function. Please feel free during the course of the talk to um, put questions into that Q and A. We'll try to leave, or don't try, we'll leave time at the end for some of your uh, thoughts or questions which we can pose to Jay or myself for that matter. Uh, should say up front that we are working with Jay on an exhibition which will include his completed film, which will include drawings and prints and sets and objects, uh, which will have been the entire working methodology for creating his new film based on his print portfolio, The Book of Only Enoch. Uh, that exhibit is likely to take place in 2022 slash 23 depends on when he's finished and when we're prepared to launch this big show. Uh, so again, thank you for joining us. Uh, brief introduction, uh, Jay was, grew up in rural Kentucky. He's lived in uh, Cincinnati for many years now. He's had exhibits at venues around the United States and beyond, but in particular a few, Bucknell University, the Contemporary Arts Center in Cincinnati, the Jocelyn Art Center in Omaha, the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, and Vanderbilt University in Nashville, just to mention a few. His works are part of the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the New York Public Library, the Seattle Art Museum, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art, the Georgia Museum of Art, and our own University of Kentucky Art Museum. His films have been presented uh, around the world to much acclaim many prizes, many accolades. And uh, there has also been in the last year or so a real resurgence in interest in his uh, music and his singing and songwriting from the past reissues of previously unavailable material and uh, just quite a lot of buzz around Jay Bolton. So Jay, welcome. Thank you, Stuart, nice to see you. Yeah, one of my favorite things is talking to you about what you're up to and um, so let's feel free to wander into whatever territory we're, we have, but we're certainly gonna share some things that you've been working on that will let people really have an understanding of how you've gone from your work as a drawer, printmaker, sculptor, mm -hmm. uh, singer, songwriter into rather elaborate handmade animated films. So I know you have some images that you can share and maybe we can just dive into. Sure. Um, some stuff. I thought, well, let's see. Wait a minute. I have to uh, share the screen, don't I? Uh, share a screen. This, that. Can you see that? Yep. All right. Uh, let's see. View, uh, enter full screen. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned the print portfolio uh, upon which this film is based. That is true to a certain extent. Uh, this portfolio of prints, uh, it, uh, as it says, was done between 2011 and 2014. Uh, I'm, I live in Cincinnati. I'm here because of a wonderful uh, kind of, you know, last of a breed seemingly, uh, except for a son, uh, 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 art dealer named Carl Solway, who I actually met in New York. And 
at the time I was living out in the forest in, in uh, kind of near Cynthiana, Kentucky. And uh, 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 he would drive down to see me. He had a gallery here in Cincinnati also. And uh, after a couple of years, I followed my work here. Uh, but I'm gonna mention him because when he saw the title of this portfolio prints, the book of Only Enoch, its subtitle is The Formerly Lost Manuscript of Benjamin Wheel, Havana, Cuba, circa 1955. And Carl said, Jay, Jay, people are, they're not, how are they gonna know that you wrote this? And I said, well, I mean, it, that's a literary conceit in a sense. I mean, I think they'll figure it out, Carl, you know? And, uh, but he was worried about that. Uh, was there a, a manuscript? No. I, I remember uh, growing up on our farm near Lexington, uh, there was a trunk from Cuba that came to our house from a relative. Uh, I don't know that his first name was Benjamin, but his last name was Wheel. He, he had, uh, you know, a lot of Jewish people had escaped uh, uh, Europe and uh, gone to South America. And he, he ended up in Havana. And I was fascinated that we had a relative in Havana, Cuba. And, uh, and there was this trunk in the basement. And I, and I, I did secretly look into it uh, and uh, it was really just some linens and, and things like that, but it would have been a lot cooler if there were a manuscript in there. <laughs> so anyway, that's where that idea comes from and it figures in the movie, but uh, uh, I had started some years ago to, to, to uh, like even, I had done a first movie in uh, what I think of as a trilogy, this being the second one of this trilogy called the Jack Leg Testament. And number one was called Jack and Eve. And uh, it was made out of woodcuts. And uh, uh, I've, I finished that in 2007 or so. And by 2008, I was making some drawings. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, let me try to find uh, one of the puppeteer. Uh, there he is. Uh, I had uh, in the first movie, Jack and Eve. Uh, the the it's based on the story of Adam and Eve, except I replace uh, Adam with a a, a, a J Jack, who is the figure inside of a Jack in the Box. And uh, Jack and Eve run off to what's called the theater of the Western world and put on a play. And it's so excoriated that people throw all kinds of fruits and vegetables at them, among them an apple. And that's how she gets the apple in my version. But then she has to go back to the Garden of Eden and start all over again with the uh, story we've all heard. And uh, so that is the conceit of the first movie. And uh, the God figure in that movie is called Novo Daddy, and it's based on William Blake's uh, concept of the God of the Old Testament. That was his name for for. Mm -hmm. But but in in the movie I'm working on that that uh, involved with you all is um, the second of this trilogy, and it, and really its full title would be the Jack Leg Testament Part Two, the Book of Only Enoch. Well. Uh, it turns out that part one was a puppet show in a seaside carnival. And uh, the puppeteer becomes the new god, you know. So uh, uh, I had started to write, uh, let's go back to the portfolio. Mm -hmm. Stuart, just, just say, Jay, uh, let, me, let me talk for a minute. Uh, if, if you need, to, if you people should. have tuned in to hear you talk, but I'll try to keep an eye on time. So, okay. we move, so we move yeah. uh, well, uh, so I had written a story that involved this puppeteer and his henchman. He has a Scottish henchman and they live in this labyrinth in, in uh, Eastern Kentucky. I can tell you exactly where, but I'm not gonna. And, uh, uh, and, uh, 
And then there was another character who I thought of as the narrator. And there was a woman uh, that he meets at this seaside carnival. And uh, uh, it was quite involved. And, and then uh, uh, the Scottish henchman goes at the beginning of this book down uh, the hollow to the where the mail is delivered. And there's a package from Havana, Cuba. And uh, it's this book. So, it, I mean, it's this portfolio of prints, which is in the movie, it's a book, uh, but it is physically these images and these, uh, this narrative. I had to decide early on that uh, to make a print portfolio, I would have to concentrate on that aspect of the story, uh, the book from Cuba. And uh, so I tried to, uh, imagine who that was, and it turned it, it turned out to be about this boy uh, named Only Enoch, uh, and he was named. This is his father here. Can you see my little pointer? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, and uh, that's the son. And there's some some regular characters here, but uh, uh, that's of course Pinocchio. That's Alice and uh, other some other folks, uh, but. Uh, only Enoch is named after a book that was an apocryphal book of the Hebrew Testament. It never made it in. It was uh, called the, the, the Book of Enoch, which is essentially about a man who uh, went to heaven and came back and lived to tell the tale. And he saw, he, he met angels up there and, and they were not, how shall I put it? They were not not what they've become advertised to be, <laughs> yeah, which I think is is why it was not uh, made it into the lexicon of the Bible. But uh, uh, I, I, and there's several versions of that. There's an Ethiopian version. There's a uh, one from the Caucasus. I forget the other. But uh, right now, but so he is named only Enoch, uh, and uh, he's an adventurous child. He uh, he often goes to uh, investigates uh, uh, coal mines in uh, when this is before strip mines when they actually had tunnels, you know, and uh, uh, and uh, he uh, particularly. I mean, I can get quite specific. Jay, don't do that. Uh, we don't have time. But uh, uh, he would make. He would start out to make a map of um, these coal tunnels. And he would be so detailed that he would put every brick and uh, he ran out of room in his bedroom and, uh, and he just kept going. So the map became this huge uh, convolutedly folded piece of paper and uh, it just took over his life. And, uh, and it got so big that he had to make a map of the map. Uh, so that figures later on with some of these other characters. Uh, he leaves home. This is a drawing. These drawings are graphite drawings that I had done quite a much before the, uh, like in 2007, 2008 and onwards, uh, uh, trying to envision this story. And uh, he leaves home. He, uh, he, is is happy in the wilderness, but uh, he starts to starve, and uh, and then he he is. Uh, uh, I have to skip ahead. He's saved by a family of this man. Uh, his name is We, and he is uh, he fixes combines and machinery, farm machinery, and so forth. And he has two daughters: one, Claire Cecilia, Claire the little one. Uh, uh, and they call her 3C for short. And there's the older daughter who's a nurse at, uh, as it says in the text, uh, the Kentucky Institute for the Criminally Insane and the Slightly Upset. And she works in the slightly upset wing. And uh, so- uh, So I wanna interrupt you yeah, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, one as a way to sort of move on a little bit, but I want, you just said something which I think could stand as a description of all, everything I've ever seen you do. And the phrase that you just said was, it was quite involved. 
<laughs> yeah. And uh, so I want to ask you, as we're looking at this image of accidental knowledge, yeah. all the images that you've shown are unbelievably dense, visually yeah. dense with pattern and detail. And, uh, and there is a kind of, you know, horror vacui, a kind of like obsessive inability to leave an empty space, really. Um, has that level of detail and uh, filling in this and, and focus on every aspect, small and large, has that always been with you, that sense of density in what you make? Because the printmaking work and the drawing works have that, you know, amazing level of presence of your mind in your hand. I mean, just look at these images. Has that uh, always been with you? And if so, like, when did you kind of realize that that was your storytelling creative mode? Well, uh, uh, I think, let's see. You know, we, we had, uh, the first time I remember being in a museum, uh, we had relatives in Chicago, and especially an aunt that I had just adored named Aunt Esther. And Aunt Esther took me, I think I must have been six or seven to the uh, Chicago Art Institute. And uh, then I came back to her house and, uh, and I was trying to <clears throat> make these drawings. And, and she said, well, what are you doing? And uh, I said, well, and I had seen, I didn't know who he was at the time, but there were some drawings I saw by uh, Giacometti. Uh, and do you know these drawings where there is the object, but there are these lines of energy around the objects that seem to suggest that, that the space which we call empty space is full too. Uh, of energy and myth and thought. And, and I, I felt like, I, even at seven, I, I, like I zeroed in on those and said, well, that's how I see the world, you know? And I was trying to make drawings like he does. And Anna Esther said, well, there are people that do that. And I said, what, what people? And she said, well, they're called artists. And I said, really? Okay. And I, that was it for me. I mean, you know, yep. so, uh, and I've always, uh, that, that's, that's that story. Shall we move on? To yeah. The, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so let's see. Uh, well, and the presence, uh, I guess, of, I mean, we should also say that the, yeah. you know, the presence of text and image. Well, the, that, that, yes. Uh, the storytelling uh, mode, if, you know, for lack of another phrase. Well, I was thinking about how to talk about that and uh, I just thought, uh, the truth is I've always seen writing as not any different from drawing, really. It's the same, you're doing the same thing, at least I am. I mean, you're, you're making marks. Uh, uh, and, uh, and of course, in the process of printmaking, one has to uh, write backwards. I worked out a lot of these, these stories on the walls of some very cooperative <laughs> museums. This one was in England. I think it was the first one in 2008 or so. And uh, so a lot of these stories were written on walls around these drawn images. Fabulous. And, uh, huh? It's fabulous. Thank Love you. it. Uh, and uh, so, what was the question? I forgot. Sorry. Well, just the, 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 just writing, the writing. Writing. presence yeah. of language. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, it tells you anything. I, you know, I was a student at the Rhode Island School of Design. And uh, after a couple of semesters, they said, okay, next semester, uh, you're going to have to, uh, what we're going to do is you're going to study uh, uh, a subject that is not what you're, like I was there as a sculptor. And the sculptors had to study whatever, painting, printmaking, the printmakers would study sculpture uh, and so forth and like that. And when they got to me, they said, well, which do you wanna do? And I said, I'd like to spend time with, uh, with literature. And they said, what? No, no, that's not what we mean. And, uh, but uh, I didn't see it as being any different. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the one, uh, I remember his name was Mr. Sullivan. There was only one 
person that talked about literature at the Rodin School of Design, and he was thrilled. No, no one had ever asked him that before to, to spend a semester uh, concentrating on what, what I thought of as storytelling when I still do. Uh, so it will seem almost criminal, but I'm going to ask you to jump ahead <laughs> yeah. past several drawings to yeah, yeah. kind of get us to the in. end. Um, well, or, uh, or maybe pick pick another one that you might have. That's the colophon, or what? 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 How would you describe the colophon page, Stuart? It's it's the information, you know, yeah. it, usually at the end of a book. And uh, shall I give? It's the, it's the credits. If we're going to stick with film it's, terminology, it's the credits. It's the credits. Yeah. And uh, so, okay, there we go. But as I was saying, there there are lots of other characters. Let's move on to uh, the one. Uh, working in progress segment that I've, I've animated uh, that I, we've agreed that I, I will show. Is that, uh, Dan, is that possible to, to do that? Uh, and should I talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, I mean, I, you mentioned that you made an early film, the first film in this sort of cycle. Yeah. By, by using your woodcuts, right? I mean, in, yes. a, in a sense, you've taught yourself computer animation, you've, you know, you've gone from being the most hands-on kind of touch-centered uh, mark-making artist to embracing and teaching yourself, you know, 21st century computer uh, uh, um, information in order to use your working drawings and sets that you've made to, to create a handmade animated film. Um, and you've done it before and your work that's sort of what you're working on right now so well, yeah I mean with the woodcut movie it it uh it was made out of it was I took pictures of woodcuts and manipulated them mm -hmm. uh, in the end uh, it, was, it was I was running out of time so I manipulated them in a computer I found a just a way to move them and they moved kind of like woodcuts would move you know they were very stiff and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I felt that was, I was good with that. And, uh, 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 but, the, but, but then I, I wanted to move on to a, a story where in, in uh, I had the opportunity to use some, uh, that was uh, by the way, a song movie. It was a it's kind of operatic, uh, operatic uh, woodcut movie. I remember one of the best, uh, I, I was I was told the the uh, one of the great lyric tenors of of England. I thought the Jack in the Box should be English for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, and I said, well, who's the best uh, lyric tenor? Lyric tenor being someone who is uh, can tell a story more than than concentrate on. Uh, that's my concept of it. Than concentrate on the sound uh, of the voice, uh, although they're wonderful singers and. Uh, and they said Nigel Robeson, and and uh, so I said, well, and and I was talking to an Englishman, a, a really well known opera director named Jonathan Eaton, uh, who was a we were friends, and uh, he he said, well, you can ask him, you know, I don't, he's, but so anyway, he he put us in touch, and uh, and he said, what do you want me to do? And I said, well, I want you to play a Jack in the Box in a movie made out of woodcuts uh, to sing that part. And uh, and I think he said the most English sentence I've ever heard in my life, but it was, uh, so let's see. Uh, he, he happened to be in Argentina. We were talking on the phone. He was doing an opera in Argentina. And I said, uh, and, and I told him that. And he said, well, Jay, uh, I could not, uh, uh, I could not uh, but be tempted, I could not but be tempted to become involved. And, uh, and uh, I said, well, does that mean yes or no? <laughs> and he said, that means yes. So, uh, well, I'm, no, gonna, I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you told this story. Yes. It's going to come back around to your innately interesting ability to conjure world-class collaborators. <laughs> well, I forgot where I was going with that, but, but I had to, 
the the movie that I'm working on now, and I have made some other movies since then. Uh, particularly, I worked uh, work. I, I had been starting this process, and then I met Elon, the lovely Elon Stavins, uh the, essay, the wonderful essayist and uh, writer and uh, teacher, and. Uh, uh, but th this was a spoken movie, uh, and and these characters had to act, and uh, and woodcuts are not great actors, you know. Uh, so I had to find a way to have them uh, be able to move better and to make expressions, and so I I had to learn a, another process. Uh, which I think I have, and we can. I can look at a bit of that if we if we have time. And uh, so, uh, let's move on to uh, uh, you know some of these later, more close to 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 now drawings. Uh, some of the characters were. Uh, no one has a name in the script. Uh, uh, they're known by narrator. Puppeteer, uh, uh, and and uh, a woman uh, who is referred to in the script as a willing girl, uh, which I, I got in a little trouble for that with some a couple of people that read some of it, and I said, "What do you mean by willing girl?" I said, "I mean that she's able to will th that that the narrator t tells her stories that he thinks he's making up." And she's able by believing them to will them into actually existing. So she's a willing girl. And they said, oh. <laughs> so anyway, uh, and uh, so I'm going to skip ahead to, uh, uh, I also so had, to, uh, sorry. No, yeah. I was going to say where your cursor is, is a, you know, a, a way to yeah, start yeah. maybe a couple uh, of I, I want to just skip ahead to, yeah. uh, to the process, uh, yeah. which I worked out. Uh, this is a set. It would be the first time you see the character called narrator. And in this this sequence, I wanted to get at least in progress under my belt because it's a very important sequence. Uh, and you'll see that, that he comes into town down this road. And uh, these markers uh, are uh, focus markers uh, or or they're able to af at one after one shoots a shot one is able to put it into the computer and have that figure out depth information like this is in front and the, and then place points on those and that's the way that one is able to make uh, the animated the drawn animated figures Kind of stick to their plane. Do you understand? So, uh, two, two, it's the way for you to locate two D information in a three D environment. Exactly. Uh, I wanted to. Uh, also, there's. I'm trying to when I can do something in camera, as they say, uh, uh, rather than say step framing, like this bell in the bell tower. You'll see in this scene I'm going to play is ringing. Uh, that's because there's a, a little dowel attached to the top of it that sticks out the back of the set. The camera, I can talk about later, is on a rail with a pan and tilt system and a focus system that you can program into a, a computer or a pad of some, and it will reproduce that shot. So once you get the focus markers, the, once you you have to know what's going to happen in the scene, so that's why these markers are here. Then you take the markers out, and the and it will reproduce that shot. Uh, but once I turned the camera on, I was running around trying to stay out of the camera's view and not throw any shadows on the screen screen, and crawling back here to make the bell ring with the dowel, and then this string on this pulley that's lifting up this what I. I uh, hope people will think of as a steel beam into the uh, the uh, coal tower here, and then there's a tipple. I mean, I used to drive with my grandfather all over eastern Kentucky in, in the 1950s, and there seemed to be coal tipples in the middle of every little town. And uh, 
uh, you know, we'd drive around and we never talked to each other. I loved it. You know, I don't know what we were doing, uh, but uh, he had a Cadillac that looked like a white Cadillac that looked like a like a bubble with two knives sticking out the back of it. You know, it was probably 1955 or something. And uh, uh, he was a, I adored him. So anyway, uh, we, so, so I'm, there's a string that goes through the set and down here. And then when I'm ringing the bell with this hand, I'm, I'm trying to, I know that there's a little man that's pulling this in the scene or will be in the scene. And you'll see him pulling the thing up, but I'm trying to count uh, how he's pulling that up and ring the bell at the same time. It, it must look like a Marx Brothers movie if you watch me trying to make a shot. You know, it's, it's uh, whew. Anyway, the, so there's the bell tower and the, the, cold, the cold tipple. And, and then I had to run around and try to make the cold come out of the cold tipple. This is all in one shot. So here, let's, shall we just play this? Sure. Uh, Dan, tell me if, uh, if there's any problem and we'll stop it. But uh, so it says play, and then I push this. There it is. I saw some things along the way, but the blood was gone. Just sinew drawn on scraps of paper and scared into moving. It was getting cold. <laughs> How much? It's the satchels for sale, hun. Not that righty old paper. Is this I want? 
How much? Well, man, go on, I'm taking it. It's free. Good reasons. Oh, there you are. Hey. So every single surface, every single move, every single atmospheric moment is your touch, every single inch of it. Well, there's nothing you see on screen except for the smoke and the fire. That's not that I didn't, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not good at making smoke and fire, but the, those are movies of smoke and fire. Uh, yeah that are laid over that uh, in, in, with a transparency channel, uh, but they're manipulated in such a way as to hopefully look as though they're part of the scene. So someone has already put into the chat a question that might be relevant now. How long has all of this taken from where you have started to where you are now? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm a good decade into it, uh, but in order to make, let's see, uh, in order to uh, uh, make something like that, uh, you, you, I mean, I'm, bu I'm building the sets and uh, 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 of course writing it and, uh, and that, that was my music. So, so you know, it's, it's a little involved, but, but and one has to develop a, cabula a vocabulary of imagery and so forth. And I'm, I'm there, you know, I'm, I'm getting there. Uh, um, uh, there is a scene that when, when that character, the narrator, I, I want to uh, thank uh, for one, the uh, kind of a hero of mine named Brad Dorf, the actor, uh, he, that was his voice. Uh, and he, he is the voice of that character. And the woman in the, uh, what I think of as a junk shop, my, my wonderful, uh, uh, friend in, in uh, studio, sometimes studio assistant uh, M said, yeah, it's not a junk shop, it's a treasure shop. I said, well, you know, to each one's own. But, uh, uh, but uh, a lot, of, there's a lot of origin story in that if you look close enough, but uh, in terms of all the characters that you'll meet later, uh, they were in buckets in the, in the junk shop. Uh, but, you know, you have to draw all that stuff. It takes a while. And, uh, and, and then I had to be a lot more deliberate about uh, when I started to involve uh, voice actors uh, on that level. Uh, the woman in the, in the junk shop is a Dale O'Brien, who was kind of the dion of uh, Actors Theater of Louisville uh, for decades. Uh, she retired some years ago, but she, she came out of retirement to do that voice for me and, and another wonderful voice uh, uh, in the movie. And, uh, the figure of the preacher there that you saw in that scene, that he becomes an important character. And he, he is the voice of uh, Will Oldham, also in Louisville. And uh, there's some wonderful uh, uh, regional theater people. And, uh, you know, so, so I've, I've been blessed in that way. Yeah. So uh, what, what was the question? Well, we were talking about the 
every aspect of the yeah. of what we're seeing being your handiwork, but maybe this is a good, since you've already broached the subject of these collaborators, uh, maybe you want to talk a little bit about just how you envision the characters being played by some people, particularly Brad, it might be worth telling a brief version of the story of just, in a sense, engaging Brad in the process. And, you know, because you've got some folks who are really world-class uh, performers, actors, in many cases, you imagine them, uh, in the case of Brad, from the beginning and, and in a way had to find your way to him to convince him to potentially play with you. It's well, kind of a miraculous story, really. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay, let, let's let's see. I mean, there's, you know, what they call the dollar version of the story, and then there's the nickel version. I'm, yeah. I'm gonna have to- Do the nickel some, version. With some nickel versions, but uh, how did uh, Brad come to do that part? I was in, I had gone to see a friend of mine in Athens, Georgia, uh, she, actually, she was my best friend for 40 years. She's she's passed on now, but uh, and she wanted to go have a drink at a bar. And uh, she asked a friend I had never met to come. And I was just beginning to write this story. And uh, and the woman who met us, uh, 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 asked about some of the characters. And I just happened to be describing the narrator character. Uh, which was the character you uh, we just played that second, and uh, um, and she said, well, if you had your choice of anybody in the world to play that to be the voice of that character, who would that be? And I said, well, Brad Dorf, uh, but that's not going to happen, you know. And she looked at me and she said, I know his girlfriend, uh, and that's that's how that began. It, it was several years later that, that I sat with Brad in a coffee shop and talked about this. And uh, uh, I remember uh, he was uh, very kind to me. And uh, 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 so, I mean, Brad, I don't know if uh, he had been, why, why Brad? Because, uh, he had been very, I, I had been, a, 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 I am a, a fan of uh, Flannery O'Connor's stories uh, and had been forever, you know, since my early 20s. And uh, one of my favorite stories of hers was Wise Blood. Uh, and he, uh, and then, I mean, it was before uh, a film, one, one of John Huston's, the director, uh, John Huston, one of his later films, uh, he did that uh, story. And, uh, and Brad played one of the main characters, Hazel Motes, uh, or the main character. And I, I just thought it was fabulous, you know? And uh, I've never thought of Wise Blood again without thinking of Brad. I mean, he was Hazel Motes and, and uh, he was able to transform himself to be this person and he did I feel in the narrator character also and uh, so when we first met I told him that story about wise blood and uh, he talked about that for a bit and uh, asked me to describe uh, what was going on and uh, I tried to make him stand uh, that character a little bit and he, he listened and uh, and then I remember he said, so where's the, okay, where's the, he said that he would, he was inclined to want to do it. And uh, I said, well, he said, well, where's the script? And I said, well, there, there, uh, I didn't want to say there isn't one, but uh, I said, well, that's in process. Uh, because, it, you know, I wasn't used to working with people from that uh, part of the world, you know, uh, and uh so, I mean, I had, I, I had written the story out and some of the dialogue, but I didn't, I had to figure out a way to write it in that form, I felt, uh, to, to respect people from that uh, tradition. And uh, I do remember this was the first meeting and, and he's a lovely, lovely man and very intense. And in at least he was, and when I, and, uh, 
he said, where's the script? And I said, well, I, it's, uh, you know, that's a process and uh, I don't quite have it yet, but uh, I was, and he, he said, well, when you, uh, when you send me the script and I find that I cannot lend my talents to it, then I'll pass. And, then, and we were like this far away at a coffee shop, a tiny little table. And, uh, and then he kind of leaned right into me and he said, so don't mess it up. And I said, well, I won't, I won't. So, uh, and that was the process of several years. And uh, fortunately we, we finished recording his part before the world shut down. And uh, he and his, his uh, girlfriend, Claudia, and, and, and uh, her uh, daughter, Cleo, who, uh, they were also kind to me. Uh, so uh, there, there are things like that. that went, uh, and uh, I mean, each one of these people has a lovely story somehow. Uh, sometimes they're not, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there are incidents that happen in a project that takes this long that are uh, just part of it. Uh, well, you also, I must say, Jay, including our own participation with you, because I met you about six years ago, and yeah. we started to think about a project, and then it became that this was the project, and then the dean and others concocted a thought that you should be our artist in residence just before COVID hit, and we have plans to have you be involved with the campus and students and all of this, and so all to say, you do inspire great confidence and faith. So people who people, whether it's, uh, you know, the voice artists or, you know, Bill Frizzell, the musician and others who've lent their, uh, you know, kind of affirmation of wanting to participate with you on this film. It takes as long as it takes. They're committed to be a part of it. And um, it's clear that you continue to just have a sort of world class coterie of people that like what you do and want to play with you and it, well, it it must make the time alone working in the studio and for the most part alone on a project that takes this long um it must shore up that process to think about these other these other factors you know i think it is i mean it, it is inspiring and one and i would i wish to live up to their belief you know uh, uh, i think i can so we'll see yeah uh, so uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Yes. Is, I mean, there are a couple of questions, which I think I can, is there anything that you feel like you'd like to say about the project at this point? Uh, it, just anything that you feel like you want to make sure to kind of get on the record on this evening's conversation before I ask you some questions? Uh, no. Okay. So one of the questions I thought was interesting is, could you speak to the Jewish content of your work? Yes. Uh, well, I'm Jewish. Uh, and uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, in, in terms of the uh, kind of outline of the story, uh, 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 only Enoch, the, in, in the beginning, the young boy in the movie, uh, is, uh, the son of, in the writing, uh, the only Jewish coal miner in Kentucky. Uh, and uh, there is a language about uh, uh, w w w when that book shows up at the puppeteer's labyrinth, uh, uh, the puppeteer uh, is uh, wonders, there's some discussion about uh, what's called sacred literature. Um, and uh, uh, he, you know, of course, there's the Hebrew Testament, but uh, uh, there, in the labyrinth of the puppeteer, there are these endless uh, shelves that I have to somehow pull off uh, visually, but uh, of books that are full of uh, possibilities of sacred literature. And there are things like uh, Kafka's, Kafka's metamorphosis, metamorphosis uh, could be a book in the Bible. Uh, Pinocchio could be a book in the Bible, according to this man. And uh, 
Uh, so uh, I have been, I have found that what uh, moves me a great deal uh, in terms of Kafka, uh, one of my favorites, uh, there was a Polish uh, Jewish man named Bruno Schultz, uh, who was also a printmaker and, uh, uh, and uh, wrote these wonderful stories that uh, I'm very moved by. Uh, and um, other people have been too. Uh, uh, Hannah Arant, uh, I find that I'm drawn to uh, to, I don't, I don't know if you would call it Jewish literature. It's, it's, it's I remember he's passed on now, but a, a man who taught literature and uh, they asked him to speak about Jewish literature and he taught a class on Harold Pinter. And they said, well, no, that's not. And he said, he said, that's not uh, Jewish literature. He's a, and, and my friend said, well, what, what, what is Jewish literature? It's, it's literature written by Jews. <laughs> And uh, so there you go. I, I don't know the answer to that. I was uh, uh, personally, uh, I, I went from growing up on a farm. It was a large working farm, but th there was a, you know, large, you know, there were 2000 cattle and a swine operation and a corn drying operation. And uh uh, and, and, but, but, I, but I would spend the weekends with my uh, grandmother, who I adored, uh, on the other side of the family, who, who was a uh, immigrant from Lithuania, uh, and uh, uh, lived on Culpeper in Lexington. And, uh, and uh, I, I knew it was mostly through her that, I mean, we would have, I would, when I was a little boy, I would spend most weekends with her or a lot of weekends with her. And uh, we would have, uh, I guess, Shabbat on Friday. And, uh, but then she would disappear and then come out uh, and I would be on the floor in her, I guess, den, you would call it. But the only thing that seemed to be on the TV at the time was Lawrence Welk, you know? And uh, that's all that all her TV had on, not on it, I don't know. But uh, then there would be, uh, you know, newspapers, uh, pages of the Daily Forward uh, that she had got. And, but I didn't, the, I mean, of course, it was in, printed in, in uh, Yiddish, which is Hebrew letters. And uh, I, it, it, I was fascinated by all of it. Uh, uh, but it was quite a dichotomy. So, so at the farm, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, I spent most of the people that, at least I, knew as a child were, were Appalachian people and black people who are all quite lovely to me. Uh, so, and then to go and, and have that, I, I, I loved all, all of it, you know? So there you go. Does that- well, and, some of the, and some of the people that you've mentioned in terms of literature. Yeah. And I would think as well, if we go back to things, you know, silent film and early film, I mean, I think there's a quality in, in your work overall, but these last couple of films for sure, of a kind of 20th century uh, trauma might be too hard a word, pres you know, moments of transformation, yes. moments of a, the sort of cloud of darkness, uh, physical and psychological and political that may hover over. I mean, I think there's a world weariness to some of your work that the films oh. have and some of the literature you're speaking about is like written in the context of the 20th century makes total sense no I'm, I'm i'm very involved with a lot of those uh i mean most i, I keep rereading the same books you know for the last four years i don't know why it's uh but it's mostly uh those people and um, um and then i i just adore flannery o'connor too who it was not jewish you know she was she was uh, of course not jewish but uh, but uh uh in uh so yeah I mean, people in, I don't, I don't know, I meet people in New York and they, they say they're, they're Jews in Kentucky. I said, well, yeah, you know, they're all over. <laughs> so, and I made a movie with, with uh, Elon Stobbins, who I adore, and he's from Mexico. And uh, th that movie's in Yiddish. And uh, the joke with us was, well, you know, uh, we're kind of the same person, but your grandparents went to Mexico and mine went to Kentucky, you know? And, uh, 
he thought that was hilarious. But uh, uh, so another a, another question for you, um, yeah. which is sort of the classic art question in many ways, uh, but I think relevant to this process where you're making decisions. Some of it's planned. Some of it's happening. I know you you had a slide. I don't know if we need to bring it up, but you you showed us you showed me a slide. Uh -huh. of, things, of things that you're finding on the way to your walk from home to the studio. I have, okay, shall we end with that? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. And, and, and so yeah. you're making this project and film, you know, in real time. Yeah. And, and real things that are happening to you are finding their way into the story and into the imagery. Um, so this question is, how do you know when the story is going to be done? Uh, uh you know, sometimes you just have to say, this is the date, you know, uh, but if you tell me it's 2022, I'd have to tell you that's not going to work, you know, but, but you had said maybe early 2023, that's a possibility. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, I, have, I have come to believe that good yeah. things are worth waiting for. So that's my position about working with you, Jay. Well, I fooled you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, I told a lot of other good people, so I feel like I'm in the right company at least. I, I wonder how to share. Oh, share, yeah. share the screen there. Can you see that? Yeah. Let's okay. just do. Uh, the... Yeah. Okay. Th this is. Uh, I'm working on uh, what I. The joke between uh, M and I is, as uh, we call it, uh, s s socialist carnival workers housing, uh, and. Uh, that's what's going on. This is a, uh, it's hard to explain, uh, but I do walk to the studio. I live in a kind of old industrial neighborhood that uh, partially was cut off by the interstate, you know, decades ago. And uh, it could be any time between 1900 and now often when you're walking and uh, I find all kinds of things. Uh, and, uh, some of it, they're working on one of the highways and they're digging up a lot of, I think it's honeysuckle, which can is the bane of highway people's existence. But, uh, and I have rules about it. I, my rule is if I find it on walk and I'm gonna use it in animation, I cannot alter it. It has to be as it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's this uh, stump that was somehow uh, from, and here's some hawthorn thorns, and here's a, some bones and magnifying glass, and uh, looks like, like to me, like an old, uh, what do you call that uh, game you play with? Uh, 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 on it's like a bocce ball, but maybe too yeah, small. Yeah, something, something in a buckeye. And uh, I mean, this is just a little bit of a whole corner of a uh, pile of stuff I have. But uh, the other day I found this, this rather pristine, I don't know if you call it a caliper. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and it felt to me like a kind of nod from another person that was a printmaker and a poet in the English, uh, the, the British uh, po poet and printmaker, William Blake, who, who I've never understood. I understand it when his books are open, but I close the book and it just all goes away. But uh, uh but I adore the way he thinks. And it's another case like Bruno Schultz of somebody who writes and does printing. Uh, and this, this, I said, what does that remind me of? And then I remembered this uh, William Blake print. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's of a character, actually not, not a, a character named uh, Urizan, but I, I think it's, uh, could, could be thought of as your reason, which which was an uh, insult uh, in Blake's mind. Uh, so, but a lot of architects use it as a uh, emblem uh, of. Uh, but but he was kind of a villain. Anyway, uh, so that's going on. And uh, these are I had made some slides of some of the. This is the puppeteer. Uh, the uh, but it, they're made up of all these bits and pieces and a lot more than this of, of graphite drawings that are composited together and then some coding is used uh, in terms of cloth and all of that. Boy, it would just take another whole hour to talk about that. So, so well, I think, yeah. I, 
I think we are, I mean, this is a great place for us to stop, I think. Okay. I think you've wandered into many of the places that we had hoped to, to wander into. I yeah. think people have a sense, not just of the intensity of the process and the, the fluidity with which you're moving between 2D, 3D uh, words, images. I think many people have commented on how mesmerizing, powerful, haunting the clip was. So I'm super happy that we gave people a taste of that. Great. And, and um, I think, uh, Jay, it's, it's, we're in the middle of the process. I'm excited about the end, but I am as thrilled to be on this journey with you as anything. And so I uh, speak for my museum staff and, and the folks at the university. We're, we're so happy to be working with you on this project. Really, we feel like it's an honor and um, it's gonna be a homecoming when it eventually gets to be seen here in Lexington and hopefully in many other places. So I guess I just want to, you know, thank you for spending time with us and giving us some insights into your, your work and for all the people that joined us uh, for the session. We appreciate that you are uh, spent some time with us as well. Well, bless you, Stuart, and, uh, and we'll talk soon. And, for sure. And thanks to Dan, uh, the, the man behind the scenes. Absolutely. All thank right. you all for joining us and have a, have a wonderful weekend. Take care. Yep. Bye.